We're very privileged to have Andrew and Annette speaking for us this afternoon. Once again, our keynotes are sponsored by Manulife. Uh, Andrew's been kind of one of my mentors as I've recently begun my own adventures in public speaking and giving talks. Um, so I'm really excited to hear from him today and uh, I'll invite him up to the stage now. Thank you very much. Uh, how is everybody doing? Head hurting? Or just like even keeled? The coffee's helping with the head. <clears throat> so I find when I go to these conferences, I trip across so many interesting ideas and interesting conversations that by the end of the day, it's just who I am, I get pretty exhausted. But, um, <clears throat> but you all seem to be holding up pretty well. So uh, I know that uh, this is a challenging spot for me. I'm between you and libation, whatever your choice is. But, uh, but I'm really uh, thrilled and honored to be asked to, uh, to share a little bit of time with you this afternoon. So uh, there's several familiar faces in the crowd uh, from my perspective, but uh, lots and lots of new ones. So <clears throat> you may be wondering, who is this guy and uh, where does he come from? So uh, a brief uh, bio. I have a long and... Uh, interesting past. So <clears throat> just uh, very quickly, I've been, uh, I've worked in the oil field. I've been a roughneck. I used to be many moons ago, a programmer uh, <clears throat> and, um, and moved more into uh, management of uh, software development. So I've been a program manager and project manager. I've, um, <clears throat> I'm a lifelong learner. So my wife calls me an info lush. And she's not wrong, ever. Um, there are many, <laughs> there are many pr approaches to, uh, to changing things. I happen to be an advocate for lean change methods and have done a lot of work and, and have some very interesting colleagues in that space. And, um, <clears throat> and I really believe that, uh, that we get things done and we get things changed through conversation. So much of my practice as a coach... Uh, both as a professional coach and as an agile coach or a lean coach, is conversation-based. So, uh, <clears throat> so that will be kind of an underlying aspect of what we'll talk about for the next uh, hour or so. Um, when I'm not uh, working, I love to be sailing, and I haven't done nearly enough of that lately. Uh, here's a couple of the places I've worked that have uh, shaped uh, the way in which I view the world and the way in which I think that... Uh, that we can improve work. So, onwards and upwards. Here's my advice for you. If you have a, hold your questions until you have one, and then blurt it out. So, so rather than, if I'm saying something that doesn't make sense, or you really uh, want a little bit more detail, just throw your hand up and, and we'll deal with it right away. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to dive into to this afternoon's session. So <clears throat> this, is a, this is a simple idea at the heart of it, and the simple idea is this. We spend so much time talking with teams and talking with one another about new things and different things and things we haven't done before. Um, why don't we talk about those things in terms that are familiar to us instead of introducing them as something new and something extra that we're piling on top. So how many people in the audience have had the experience of, oh, we're trying this new process and somebody is on me to do an extra report or change the way in which I record requirements or you name your whatever something silly somebody's asking you to do. I, Okay, and isn't it worse now that we're trying to inject agile processes and move from the way in which we've used to organize our work to, to doing something completely different? There are all of these coaches and scrum masters and, <clears throat> and, and all the rest of the people too, right? Asking you to do extra things. And it's just like, leave me alone, let me get my work done. Is that 
kind of a common sentiment in the crowd? It's certainly been my experience. And when, <clears throat> when people come along and say, oh, we're going to do something new, and that means you have to do this additional stuff, I go like, what's up with that? And, and I run into it a lot when I'm the one asking people to do something different. So, how many pe people in the room are programmers? Okay. And how many people in the room are familiar with the object model in the, in the course of their work? Okay, so as testers, we run into page object, usage of page object model, and, and then there's the DOM that we need to navigate when we're testing web pages. So object-oriented concepts are something that we work with every day. <clears throat> how many people use object-oriented concepts when they talk about how they're organizing their team or how they're organizing their day? Not very many of us, right? So my simple idea is this. Let's talk about how we organize ourselves in the terms that we use every day for the work that we do. So it's a simple idea, but it's not a small one. So we're going to walk through this and what it means. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to give you my very simplified view of the object model. So if you're deeply uh, imbued in object-oriented thinking, please give me a break. <laughs> but I think it will paint a, a useful picture for you. So why is the object-oriented view of the world important to software? And where did it come from? So there's some of you in the crowd for whom there has really been no other way of viewing software. It's like there are people in the world now who have never experienced life without the internet. It's just the you know, soup you swim in. But <clears throat> uh, it came from somewhere, and it came from a lot of work that kind of culminated uh, in the early 80s. Um, and probably the the most vocal sp spokesperson for object-oriented um, <coughs> design is a man named Alan Kay. We'll talk about it. But Grady Booch has this to say about, uh, about object-oriented design, because uh, when it was emerging, it was, it was revolutionary. And Grady Booch is kind of like the architect emeritus at IBM and has been active in this space forever. Um, so he says that it's fundamentally different from the way that we viewed the world before, which is in a very structured, top-down kind of way. And it produces architectures that, that are remarkably different from, um, from, the, from the way in which we've decomposed and built software in the past. <coughs> and I happen to agree with him. So much so that when I use these ideas on, in, in the context of teams... I take exactly his quote and just change it from software architectures to organizational architectures. We can use these same ideas, but when we do that, it's very different from the way in which we have organized work and organized teams and, uh, and had teams interact uh, from the past. So I'm going to use uh, an example for people who have a hard time imagining how we might use object-oriented thought to, to describe how people interact and, uh, and apply it to our experience in restaurants. So when we go to a restaurant, uh, how do we know what the restaurant is capable of doing? The restaurant has an interface, has a catalog of things that we can query and say, what can you do for me? And we call it a menu. And once you look at the menu, you don't go running back into the kitchen and say, hey, you know, I want this beef dish or I want this fish dish. No. We pass a message to the kitchen. And we do that using a waiter or a waitress. That's our message protocol to the kitchen. So... <clears throat> That interface isolates us from the kitchen. And again, there's, a, there's an interface between the, the server and, uh, and the kitchen, but the kitchen lives as an object. 
It knows stuff that you don't know. It knows how to do stuff that you don't know. But you rely on it to respond to your message with a cooked meal. Does that make sense to people? Has that been your experience in restaurants? That you don't need to go and negotiate with the chef to get what you want? It's very rare that you have to do that. <clears throat> but we don't think about this as being an object, message-passing, oriented situation in our lives. Right? That's just the way things work. Now, if the kitchen had a fire, but the front of the house was still fine, they could be catering from down the street. You wouldn't care, as long as the stuff that was described on the menu was the stuff that was arriving at your table. And that's the, one of the benefits of object-oriented design. We don't need to know how the kitchen is operating. We just need to know that we can pass it a message and get a response. So this relationship between us and other objects is how it's kind of like an infrastructure for getting stuff done. In this case, getting food served to us. But there are many, many other circumstances where you pass a message and you get a response because you need to get stuff done. So here's my object-oriented design 101, very fast. So what's special about objects? So objects are autonomous. They live on their own, and they can do things, just like the kitchen. Don't need to interfere with it, but um, <clears throat> we count on it being able to do things. And that objects know stuff. So they have uh, knowledge that is private, and some kitchens, you don't want to know what the chef knows. <laughs> Just like in some programs, you don't want to know <laughs> what the program knows. But, um, but it's this idea of encapsulation that is critical to, uh, to objectness. We can put a wrapper around the stuff that objects know and the stuff that objects do. <clears throat> Objects have behavior, and um, so when you pass it a message, we expect some behavior from an object. Again, back to the kitchen, we expect cooking to happen. Um, so it's kind of like objects are these animated stores of data or knowledge, and we can query them and expect a response. Sometimes we don't get the response that we want. And who is here in Hillary's session on testing RESTful uh, APIs. So there's a whole protocol around, oh, I expect this response and I get back something different. And how do we handle that? So I ordered fish and I got beef. Not good. Or I ordered fish and I got nothing. <laughs> Even worse. So objects interact with one another via messages. And so it's really a message passing uh, kind of architecture. And actually, Alan Kay, who uh, is credited with calling it uh, object-oriented design, said if he had to do it all over again, he'd call it message passing architecture rather than an object-oriented architecture. Because messages, it's the interaction between objects that makes things happen. If objects just sat there and didn't talk with one another, didn't interact, that's not particularly useful. So, um, <clears throat> I'm a huge fan of uh, Sandy Metz. I don't know, has anybody here ever seen Sandy Metz present or know about Sandy Metz? Sandy Metz is a leading proponent of object-oriented design, particularly in the Ruby community. She wrote a fantastic book called uh, Practical Object-Oriented Design in Ruby. And <clears throat> if you have a chance, take the time to watch a Sandy Metz presentation, because there's nobody I know or have encountered who is so crystal clear on um, how object-oriented 
uh, design can be imp implemented and exploited. <coughs> but this uh, quote from Sandy Metz is something that really resonates for me because we always get it backwards. Like we create objects and expect to do something with them. But that's really not the case. What we have is a message that we're trying to pass to somebody, something that we want done, and then we have an object that can respond to that. And so it is with teams. We don't just create teams because we can, do we? No, we're trying to get something done. We're trying to pass a message to get some work done or some, something to happen, and we need an object to respond to our message. So we create one. And so this is at the heart of why object-oriented design can be applied to team design. Now, I mentioned earlier that objects are autonomous. They stand on their own. But, um, and this is a, a problem that we encounter in agile adoption all the time. Hey, teams are supposed to be self-organizing and autonomous. Objects are autonomous. That doesn't mean they can do whatever they want, especially when they're interacting with one another. So an object's autonomy doesn't extend to being autonomous about how it communicates to other objects. So we have these protocols, these standards, you know, fixed ways that everybody agrees we're going to talk between objects. <coughs> so we were talking about um, um, these RESTful services earlier. We have the HTTP protocol, which defines what messages look like and what responses look like between objects. <coughs> we don't care what happens inside the object, but boy, when they're talking to one another, they better be talking the same language. <coughs> so team objects, if I can use that term, uh, communicate by the way in which they behave. There are behavioral standards that we expect. <coughs> so being polite with one another is maybe a behavioral <laughs> norm inside your organization. I certainly hope it is. But there are also other th ways in which uh, teams coordinate. And so there may be technical standards uh, that apply and cultural standards, just the way in which we choose to behave with one another over time. So, any puzzlement here? Am I, do you think I'm completely visiting from outer space when I, when I you know, talk about these ideas? Because we're going to dive a little bit deeper now. Now that I've made the premise that we can talk about teams as if they're objects, let's talk about APIs. So what is an API? Anybody? APIs are just agreements. So we agree that we will exchange information in a particular way. It's kind of the rules of engagement for two objects. And in technical terms, it gets implemented as a public interface. So I can go and query an object or send an object a message to its public interface and expect a standard response in return. That's the contract of an API. And it's the basis of contract testing. If we can understand what the API is, we can test that contract between objects. So why is it valuable? Because we have this, this agreement about how an object will react to our message, it separates how it works from how it's used. Back to the kitchen. I don't care how the kitchen works. I use it to feed me. <laughs> but, um, and I can separate that, and I can change the chef, and I can change the, the mechanics of, how, of the kitchen and not worry about it, because that's not how, I don't care how it works. I care how I use it. And <clears throat> by doing that, we decouple or loosen the coupling between 
my use of the kitchen and its implementation. That's important because it supports change and extension and um, other modifications to the inside of the object that you're dealing with. Or, in my example, the kitchen. And here's a, the flip side of that. When we bypass the public interface and reach right inside an object to talk to one of its private methods, or we bypass the protocol, the, the interface for a team, and reach right inside that team and ask it for information or for action, we're really creating kind of a, a, a tight coupling which creates technical debt, or, and, and as an extension of that, organizational debt. So if I'm dealing with a team, and I know that Josh really is the source of all good information about what the team is doing, I don't bother you know, dealing with their public interface. I go right to Josh. Go like, what's up, Josh? What are you guys doing? And he tells me, maybe. <clears throat> but then Josh decides to go on a canoe trip for three months. So now I don't have Josh's information. And I don't know how to query the team because, I have, because I've bypassed their, their public API. So I don't know how to find out what the team is doing. So this gets multiplied across organizations because of our nature to you know, have personal uh, relationships and not take the time to build you know, a strong interface for our team. And um, how many people have seen this play out in their workplace where there are people who are in the know and they're the go-to people. And when they're not around, things don't quite work as well. Not because they couldn't, but just because we didn't take the time to build some public interfaces. So how can we take advantage of this idea, this idea of an API and uh, a messaging interface around our teams? Well, in the same way that we do with our programs, we build public interfaces so that external objects can get us to do uh, <coughs> or get information that they need without really understanding what's happening under the covers. This is a fundamentally important aspect of object-oriented thinking. And I'm suggesting that we can apply it to our teams and really take advantage of it. So I'm going to uh, take a cue from Hillary, unbeknownst to me, and I'm going to use the restful architectural style to illustrate how this applies to teams. Does anybody think that's a crazy idea? <laughs> Who would? So let's give it a go. So restful message types, there are others, but these are the key ones. Who is not familiar when, with the term restful when I say restful? Wow, okay, so one, one thank you for you know, being honest about that. So restful, is a, is a style, it's an architectural style for communicating, <coughs> and it, uh, it, it's actually an acronym, so the source of it is up there. Um, it stands for, or is derived from represent, representational um, state transfer. So it's a, it's a way of passing information between objects um, with a fixed protocol. So, I'm going to talk about the four big uh, restful verbs, if you like. So post is how you actually put information into an object. Uh, sorry, uh, update. Put is put, as the, as the name it quite accurately describes it. Getting is the one that we are most familiar with. So we get information from an object, from a restful object, most frequently. So every time you request something from a web page, it's really a get request under the covers. And delete is self-explanatory too. 
So what do those look like in the context of teams? So this may be a bit of a stretch, but <clears throat> I'm, gonna, I'm going to push the model a little bit, and please stop me or argue if you think that, that I've kind of abused the, or, or stretched it too far. So we've all been on teams where we ingest work. Somebody gives us work, and so they're posting work to us. So the kinds of messages that we get are, work on this initiative, build this thing, is a, is a post to our team. Or maybe it's, add this team member. It's another post. You're changing the way in which your team is constructed or working, and you need to have a response to that. Puts are like updates. So, yeah, okay, you guys are plowing ahead on whatever it is you're working on, and you're doing an awesome job. But guess what? This thing you're doing, I want you to do it differently. Maybe I want to reprioritize something, or I want you to shift emphasis, or maybe add something to your backlog. Another kind of message, which is an update, sort of message is, can you do this other thing? I know you're busy. I know you're all like working really hard, but you know I have this other thing that I want you to do, and I, I, I really need to know if you can do it. So that's kind of an update to work that's already in your queue, re consumes capacity from the team, and we need to be able to respond to that kind of message as a team. <clears throat> so here are all the kind of get messages that teams encounter all the time. We don't think of them as get messages. We think of them as annoyances. <laughs> you know, what are you working on? Well, that's, isn't that obvious? <laughs> well, to some, yes. To others, not so much. My favorite, when will you be done? Um, that seems to cause some problems, but it's a standard message that teams receive, correct? Seeing some nodding heads. What skill sets do you need? Like, do you really have the capacity and the capability that you need to do the work that I'm asking you to do? Who is dependent on you? And the flip side of that, who are you dependent on? So imagine these messages being passed into your team and the response, 404. <laughs> Not very encouraging. But it's an interesting way to think about how people perceive us. They're passing us messages, and they're getting responses. And maybe the responses they're getting are not the ones that make them happy. They're 404s. They're 300s. I need more information. <laughs> Thank you, Hillary. They're 500s. Like, we don't know. <laughs> um, and then the we get other questions that are often, maybe they're asked indirectly, but like, what kind of risk are you accepting in the way that you've chosen to do your work? Like, do you even know what kind of risks? And those questions get couched in messages like, what could possibly go wrong? Or, where is your risk register? Um, what are your dependencies? I mentioned a little bit earlier. What will be delivered? Which is quite apart from when will you deliver it. You know, what exactly is it that we're getting when you say you're releasing in however many days? And one of my favorites and one that, um, <clears throat> that none of us pay enough attention to is, is this work sustainable by this team? What's the morale of the team? So that's so... It's not asked often enough. We don't get that message often enough, but it's a really important message. <clears throat> then we get the delete messages. Yeah, all that good work you've been doing, stop that. We're going to do something else. Or, even worse, your team, we're going to split it up. Somehow, we need to 
change the composition of the team? And how do we respond to that? So all of these are examples. I'm sure you have others as you start to think through this lens of what kind of messages does my team get? Is it a put? Is it a get? So in the object-oriented world, messages are responded to by methods. This is something that objects know how to do. It's part of the, their ability to do things. They have methods. And of course, they have encapsulated local knowledge. So what does that look like? What kinds of tools or methods do we have in order to respond to these messages? I'm going to suggest a bunch, and then I'm going to give you examples. And you're going to go, where can I learn more about this? <laughs> so for post messages, you know, work on this initiative are often accompanied by vision statements and insufficient detail to actually get the work done. So the kinds of things that help um, post messages land well inside of Teams are things like story maps. So yes, I have a vision of what it is I want you to produce, but I've decomposed it. And uh, story maps are a decomposition technique that help people gain alignment on what needs to be done. Working agreements. This is kind of a fundamental practice for uh, agile teams and a huge benefit when you're adding members to your team. If you can actually enumerate, here are the ways in which we've agreed we are going to work together. So when somebody's coming on board, they know right away what's acceptable behavior and what's not, what's helpful, what's not, and how the team celebrates and decides. All of these are things inside of working agreements. Similarly, for put messages, we can end up with, uh, <coughs> with methods that can help us, and uh, sometimes they're the same methods. So again, story maps, options boards, release plans. These are all methods that we as team members can use to respond to these pesky messages. <coughs> How many people in the room practice story mapping as part of their definition of product? Ah, so I can introduce some new methods to you. Not very many. So here's a whole set of methods that we can use to respond to these get messages. And um, again, story map, what are you working on? Story map is a perfect way to, uh, to explain to people what you're doing now, what you're doing next, what you're doing later, if ever. Um, <clears throat> what skill sets do you have? How many teams have you, have you encountered that actually has a listing of what its members can, can do, what they're good at, and what they'd like to learn how to do? Anybody? Okay. Awesome but not enough. <laughs> um, risk assessments. So doing risk assessments is kind of a standard traditional project management practice. How many people are doing risk assessments in this more fast-paced, adaptive, agile world? I expect to see lots of hands go up. And I'm seeing a couple of these. So it's not something that we do as a standard practice because <clears throat> it feels like hard. We don't know really what we're doing, so how could we possibly assess the risk? So I'm going to show you how to do that. 
Uh, and there are other things that we can do. Uh, defect densities is really a strong practice to show, well, how well are, are we doing at producing good, stable, safe to release code? Kind of an important thing to be able to respond to, like, is your code safe to release? Ah, 404. I don't know. Not so good. Um, <clears throat> and there are other uh, techniques that, uh, that are listed here that answer these kinds of messages, like, what, what are your dependencies? How do you express those? Like, often I hear, well, I can't release because that team over there hasn't done their thing. Which is great for you as a, as a single team, but imagine if there are a hundred teams. How does somebody get an overall picture of what does that you know, dependency ball of mud look like? How can we possibly do that? Make that visible and be able to answer that question what are you dependent on, and who's depending on you? Um, <clears throat> so what will be delivered, when will it be delivered, and how long it will take? All of these questions, I think, are reasonable questions, don't you? I mean, don't you ask the waiter, when is my dinner arriving? And expect to get an answer that's kind of within some reasonable norms? So why is it that <clears throat> teams often take the stance of, oh, you'll get what you get when you get it? <sighs> I think we can do better than that. And I think people expect better. And so we have some methods to answer those get messages. And finally, talked about the team morale. Uh, <clears throat> there are methods in which we can keep track of the sentiment, the mood, the the uh, morale of the team. How can we do that and make it visible so that we can make better decisions about what to do in the future? So all of these things are about making decisions. I mean, you kind of peel it away. Uh, these messages are getting passed to teams so that you can make decisions about what, uh, what to do next. So, and again, for delete messages, we run into kind of the same... Same problem. So, <clears throat> I'm going to show you examples of each of these things. And um, so, who has seen and used story maps? Okay. So, here's a sample story map created. Uh, <clears throat> this particular example is a, is a training example from my good friend Steve Rogalski. To give credit where credit is due. So, story maps are great because they help people get aligned on what needs to be done and why. So, in this particular story map, above the line, the, the darker orange uh, stickies and the blue stickies really tell the story of what our customer is trying to do. The yellow stickies are much more oriented towards what we have to do as a team in order to make those things come true. <clears throat> and in this particular case, a story map is also being used to demonstrate progress and uh, current activity. So if you look down in the yellow line, there's some little baby stickies in a couple of spots. So one, <clears throat> one color of sticky is saying, this is done. Another color is, this is what we're working on. So with a single method, the story map method, we are now in a position as a team to respond to at least three of these messages that we get as standard get messages. What are you doing? What have you done? What's next? One method. That's why I call story mapping a foundational method because it ties together the dreams of product managers and the capability of teams to deliver. It 
fills in that gap between <coughs> high-level dreams and lower-level actions. So, story maps, fantastic. Skills matrix. Here's an empty one. Has anybody seen a chart like this? <coughs> Again, small number of people. So this is a very simple thing to do. And uh, so I filled one out here. Just noodling around. So this gives you a great picture. Would you want to live on this team or in this team? We have Bob, who's, uh, who's a great programmer. He can code like crazy and teach other people. But uh, that's it. That's all Bob does. We've got Mary, who's pretty good at testing, but not confident enough to teach other people how she does that so well. We've got Jill, who's she can code a little bit, and she can has some deployment skills, so that's awesome. That's a good thing to have on your team. And then we've got Joe, who uh, all he can do is bake, and not very well. And the most critical skill of all, nobody can make coffee. Nobody on this team can make coffee. So... I'm using this as kind of a facetious example, but what a useful tool to, you know, put development plans for your team members, to look at opportunities for pairing, for making a case for hiring, for making a case for training. And it's like, and the, the message that this responds to is, what are you folks capable of doing? So, very strong, very simple. None of these things are, you know, like mind-bogglingly difficult to get your hands around, but we just don't do them because we don't think of responding to these messages with methods. It's like somebody comes along and says, can you guys do this work? And it's like, yeah, I guess so, or maybe, or I don't know. So a very simple skills matrix like this. And there's fantastic exercises you can do. You know, marketplace of skills as a team building exercise or as part of a retrospective. Um, and fill out these charts. And, um, and who knows, if you made them public, posted them on the wall outside your cubicle, somebody might come along and say, I'm looking for somebody who can bake. That was an example. So... On to the next, risk assessment. Does it sound like a really difficult thing to do? So here's a very simple risk assessment tool. You can modify it, change it, do whatever you want. This is a spider graph or a radar chart. Each one of the legs on this chart represents some exposure to risk. So I'm not saying that this needs to be scientific or accurate, but it needs to show some thoughtfulness about just how deep are we in this thing. So in this particular case, the life cycle branch shows, you know, <clears throat> the riskiest thing to do is to do something absolutely new. The least risky thing is to be working on our cash cow product. Everybody knows how that works. So it's that kind of level of assessment that I'm urging you to at least start with. And so these other things. What is the cost of delaying? Like is it kind of standard or does it peak? That's kind of a... deserves a lot more talk. And I'm happy to do a whole talk on cost of delay. Um, but what's the impact of delaying? So sometimes you can delay and, ah, no big deal. Other times you can delay doing something and the company goes out of business. It's an extinction level event. Um, audience size. 
whatever it is you're doing is, is relevant to only a small number of people? Or is it everybody who uses your product? Well, clearly, when you're touching lots of lives, lots of users, that's riskier. And so it goes. But <clears throat> all you need to do is have a conversation and plot this out. So this is not only good for teams, it's good for portfolio assessment, prioritization, all kinds of decisions that need to be made. And you need to have some sense of, is this thing more risky than that thing? And very, very quickly, you can sort through and assess uh, different options. Does that look difficult? Does it look useful? Are you guys tired? Here's my most fun uh, depiction of defect density. So this comes from a fantastic book called uh, your, <coughs> uh, your Code in, is, as a Crime Scene. Anybody familiar with this book? So um, Adam uh, Tornhill um, gave a great TED talk on using this technique. And he's using essentially um, forensic science techniques to determine where should we be focused on analyzing defects in our code base. So he uses the metaphor of a city. So the city, and there's actually open source code that builds this depiction of a city by traversing your repo. And it sees where the most files are and where the most file activity is. And then he maps on top of that where are the most defects. And the idea is we don't want to send the cops out to a low crime scene or a low crime neighborhood. That's kind of a waste of time. <laughs> we want our best detectives and our toughest cops hanging around high crime rate neighborhoods. That's where we're going to get bang for our buck and lower the crime rate. It's just such a simple idea, and it's easily done. Um, so it's this kind of response to, well, how safe is it to release your code? Or... What's your defect rate? It's kind of a novel and interesting way to go about this. <clears throat> so, Adam Tornhill, your code is a crime scene. It's fantastic. Yeah. So, um, when I was working at D2L, there was a team that, uh, during one of the hackathons, used this technique. They didn't build the cityscape, but they used the technique of finding the highest uh, activity uh, folder in their repo. And what do you think it was? Anybody, any guesses? Where the most changes were being made by the most people? Automated test, you're absolutely right. So, what a wonderful thing. People were saying, well, <clears throat> how come that's so active? It's because we're doing lots of testing. It's great. But what a great response to a message, right? Like, what is all this activity going on in there? Well, we're testing. Fantastic response. Um, so, throughput. And... Um, and responding to the message, what are you guys doing? And how quickly can you get work done? How efficient are you? All those horrible productivity kind of messages. <laughs> and we get into religious wars about story points and not story points and all kinds of things. So I'm a... I don't think fanboy even quite wraps up how I feel about Troy McGinnis. <laughs> Troy McGinnis should be nominated for sainthood, in my view. 
Troy McGinnis is a statistician who works with data to improve team performance. And he does it in an amazing, accessible, and humble way. And he gives it all away for free. So he has embedded all of his modeling techniques in spreadsheets. They're all available in his GitHub repo. And help yourself. So these two charts uh, are from a single, um, single spreadsheet that, uh, that Troy makes available. And, um, and it's kind of a funny story about how he did this. He, he was homesick, had nothing to do. This is the kind of guy Troy is. I'm homesick, nothing to do. I've got my nose in a book. Troy is homesick, nothing to do. He's building spreadsheets to see how many charts he can create if he has one data point around a piece of work. He said, if I have a story and I know when it started, how many charts can I build that might be useful to make decisions about that? And then he went, what if I have two pieces of data about a piece of work? I know when it started and I know when it finished. So he built this spreadsheet and he generates 17 different charts from two pieces of data. Not difficult. You can do exactly the same thing and you can use his spreadsheet, your data. Oops, sorry. So these are my two favorite charts. The one on the top is just showing a moving record of how many stories your team finishes over time. So, what do you notice about that? It's highly variable. And that's the nature of our work. It's not nicely chunked up and every two days we're going to finish a story, like a factory. It doesn't work that way. But over time, you can see the trend of roughly what you can expect this team to chunk through in a given period of time. This is like gold when somebody comes to you and says, ah, how long will it take you to do some work? How many stories? I have 100 stories. Well, my team can do 10 stories a week. I guess that'll be 10 weeks, roughly. So Troy's tools allow you to do that. I'm oversimplifying. His are uh, much more interesting in the sense that he allows you to put ranges in. And then he goes off and, um, and does simulation of what your team's pr productivity will be like. The other chart at the bottom is, um, is equally useful. All it's showing is the net of how many things did we start versus how many things did we finish in a given week? So it's speaking to how much work in process is this team juggling? So week number two is looking pretty dire, I would say. We finished, we started way more things than we, than we finished. So that just piles, that's work that piles up, right? And it makes it more difficult to finish because we're moving between, we're juggling things. So just this representation as a response to what are you guys working on is hugely helpful. Like we started all these things and guess what? Nothing's getting done. Let's stop starting and let's start finishing. So these are very simple methods to respond to messages about how long will it take you to get stuff done. Oops, that's not good. Um, not sure why that's not happening, but we'll get there. How many people use or have seen cumulative flow diagrams? 
So just like the story map is like one of the most useful representations of work we have to do, the cumulative flow diagram is one of the most useful representations of work that we have done. So this is a very simple hand-sketched one. You can do cumulative flow diagrams um, in Excel. You can most um, um, tools now provide a cumulative flow uh, analysis of, of a team's work. But this is, um, in a single visualization, shows what's happening with demand on the team and what's happening with how they're chunking through that demand. And you can just, over, if you look at these enough, you can just look at a team's cumulative flow diagram and see if they're in trouble. <laughs> if the lines are really jagged, that's work piling up. If the lines are smooth and going up to the right, that team is in flow, work is flowing through. If the backlog takes a huge jump, that tells you that <coughs> they're... Um, that uh, demand is growing probably at a pace that outstrips the team to ability to deliver. All of these things just from looking at a simple one simple graph. Um, so I strongly, strongly recommend, if you're not familiar with cumulative flow diagrams, <coughs> great method to respond to that message. How much longer? I used one of these uh, when I was working in a company. There was a team that was delivering, they were working on uh, PeopleSoft HR implementation. There was a team delivering features. They were pretty steady state. Um, but the, <coughs> the sponsor of this initiative, the S SVP of HR, was uh, really kind of dissatisfied. He thought that things were going really slow. And he had a big release date coming up. So we're in March, he wants everything done in November. And so we just plotted out a very simple CFD chart. So the slope of the team delivery, we'll call it X. The slope of the backlog increase, 3X. Not going to meet any time really soon. So it was relatively sparse data. It was a pretty simplistic analysis but the conclusion was ir irrefutable. This team is not going to get this work done. So we took it to the SVP and plunked it in front of him and said, here's where you are, here's November, here's the gap, do you think you're going to be happy? And of course his response was, what are you guys doing to me? But he agreed, no, I'm not going to be happy. Like, what is causing this, you know, divergence in what we're demanding and what we're delivering? And so, well, it's all of your direct reports. All of your VPs are coming down and asking for extra stuff and, you know, keeping the team from improving its delivery rate. But also, you just keep adding, like, more modules and without any regard to what the actual capacity of the team is. And so that resulted in deferring the release of a couple of modules, which flattened the, flattened the backlog curve. <clears throat> now we could have a real discussion about how do we Im improve throughput in the team. Is that like get another team? Anyway, very simple diagram, very simple interpretation of that diagram led to huge improvements in the in the circumstances for the team. All a response to the message, when will you be done? Um, so, this idea of using object oriented I view of the world and object oriented ideas to apply them to team dynamics and behavior didn't just occur to me in a dream. And um, <clears throat> if you're a reader, like I am, I can recommend these books. The Sandy Metz I talked about earlier. Uh, that's kind of the programmer's programmer with respect to object-oriented design and usage. And this is her book, 
The fact that it's about Ruby uh, doesn't particularly matter. The way in which she describes how to parse through uh, the implementation of objects is just brilliant. Dave Gray, who was just here in town, he was at the Flexible uh, conference, yay Flexible, best conference ever, apart from this one, um, is a UX conference, and Dave Gray writes broadly on, uh, <coughs> on evolving uh, organizational structures, and, um, and the Connected Company is kind of a collection of writing. Uh, my favorite quote from Dave Gray from that book is, <coughs> the future is podular, and he really sees a future of effective organizations being these autonomous teams that accept work and interact with one another. Um, so that was a huge inspiration for my view of this is how uh, effective com companies are going to be effective in the future. Uh, David West, uh, um, <coughs> object thinking is kind of a really good um, introductory uh, piece of writing into the, the world of object-oriented thinking and design. And David Taylor has taken it a step further and extracted it from the technology software development world <coughs> into organizational design. So all of these uh, were highly influential in putting this talk together and in the way that I approach organizational improvement situations. So that kind of wraps it up for me. There's quest if you have any questions, I would entertain them now. My call to action for you is to think about these things <clears throat> through the lens of the work that you do every day. The way in which we organize our work and the way in which people make demands of us seem like they're alien from the work that we do. But if we look through the lens that we use almost without thinking every day, we can come up with ways of improving our team life, improving the interactions between teams, and just moving ourselves into a better spot overall. So thanks for your attention. I hope this has been interesting. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, and we're free to go and celebrate. No questions? I fear I've done you all in. Okay. So the question is, uh, how can companies help teams um, express what they're capable of doing so that everybody knows what all of these diverse teams are capable of and who they should go to with a particular message? Is that yeah. fair? Okay. So I, I think that's a fantastic uh, question, and it's clearly a challenge, especially when you know there's tens and tens of teams, maybe hundreds of teams. Um, and I think they get, that question gets answered to a certain extent by the way in which the teams are deployed against the challenges of the company. So whether that's by business line or whether it's by technology area, we have a sense that some teams have capability in these particular areas. Uh, there's always variation. Um, but... One of the tactics that I've seen in response to that is to uh, support um, a catalog, sort of an, a knowledge catalog, um, that allows people to say, who, 
who is a subject matter expert or an implementation expert in this particular problem, whether it's a business domain or whether it's a technical domain. <clears throat> and running that kind of skills inventory, if you like, can be hugely helpful in identifying who could I at least first send a message to. And maybe I'll get a, a message back about, oh, I need more information or you need to, it's a referral message, you need to go talk to, to this team. So there's a couple of ways to do that. The one is to invite people to self-describe, say, what do you know, and put it in some kind of repo. The other is uh, to use survey techniques and publish, uh, <coughs> publish the, the results of that. There's um, some very interesting social network analysis techniques for finding out who has <coughs> huge centrality or is a referral point for many, many people. So you can do that for knowledge networks. And you, <coughs> you do that by asking questions like, who do you go to when you have a technical problem in a particular domain? And <coughs> if you ask that question of a large uh, group of people, then you'll see who pops up to the top of the list. And <coughs> exposing that kind of availability of knowledge is, is a pretty interesting way to go about it. Any others? Um, I would like to find the one diag diagram that I missed because it's kind of relevant to that question. And this is, um, excuse me, this is a method that is a response to the message of um, who are you dependent on and who's dependent on you. And it's often hard to maintain these dependency relationships uh, because they change over time and change quite rapidly. But uh, this is using a tool called Node Excel. It's a social network analysis tool. And you just define relationships between two entities. You say A depends on B, and then B depends on A. That gives you a bidirectional line. And then maybe you have C depends on A, and D depends on A, and E depends on A. <coughs> and it allows you to identify those, those uh, nodes. And then it goes off and calculates the relationship between them all and builds a graph for you. It's a fantastically easy tool to use. And this is an actual um, dependency map for companies that shall remain unnamed. And I had to go in and scribble out all the names of the nodes because they're actual projects or initiatives. But you can see that some are highly central. People are saying, I'm dependent on those, on the output from that, that team in order for me to be successful. And it shows chains of dependencies. Um, so a very simple tool like that. I mean, Node Excel is, is one example of it. Um, but uh, Gephi is an open source program. does the same kind of thing. And there are other tools, uh, like many other tools, all of which are kind of in the, in the domain of social network analysis. Uh, so that was prompted by, by your question about how do I expose things. So imagine if you were <coughs> building relationships between people based on knowledge or based on trust or based on you know, domain expertise. You could do exactly the same thing. The, <coughs> the CRA, our friendly tax folks, did this kind of analysis uh, about knowledge. And they said, who do you... So the survey question they asked was, who do you go to when you have kind of a gnarly tax question to resolve? And they surveyed this department inside of CRA, and two nodes showed up really dominantly central. They were clearly the go-to people to answer difficult tax questions. So that kind of led people to go, well, who are those people? Um, because most of these kind of HR-related surveys are sort of disguised and anonymous. But it was so important that they 
kind of lifted the lid a little bit, turned out that both those people were retiring within 15 months. So here are the most highly knowledgeable, most highly referenced go-to people inside your organization. They're going to be gone. And one thing that you can do, well, at least with the software that was used in that study, is that you can remove nodes. You can do modeling. So what does this network, this relationship look like if I remove those nodes? And it was disastrous. There were like, it went from being a connected network to being just you know, islands of people that had no connection to other people. So that prompted some different action. So <clears throat> there's all kinds of interesting ways to attack these problems of responding to other people's messages. And I've just given you a glimpse. But I've given you a glimpse through the lens of this object-oriented view of the world. And I hope that it's been interesting and I hope it will prove useful. Thanks. Thanks.